The story of prisoner of war camps is one of the grimmest chapters in the history of the American Civil War. The collections of the Museum of the Confederacy are filled with artifacts and documents of life inside prisons. And while these artifacts and documents certainly testify to the hardships and suffering, they testify to something else, to the spirit of men and to the spirit of industry and commerce. Within these prisons and prison camps, men struggled against the most deadly enemy, disease, and against another more common enemy, boredom. Prisoners forged communities and economies. They made things to trade and sell to each other and through prison officials to people outside the prison walls. This was the beginning of what came to be known in prisons north and south as the ring trade. The manufacture of rings and breast pins from gutta percha buttons is one of the means resorted to by the prisoners to raise money. It is astonishing what beautiful work of this kind is gotten up at the barracks and it is the more remarkable as the men have but few tools and work under all sorts of disadvantages. The Reverend Isaac Handy, prisoner at Fort Delaware. The Museum of the Confederacy has a huge collection of prisoner of war art uh, numbering more than 200 pieces and representing about uh, more than 20 different prison camps north and south. The, uh, the greatest number come from Fort Delaware in Johnson's Island, Elmira, and uh, Point Lookout. When you look at the pieces, you're, it's very clear that the men who made these things had a lot of time on their hands, for one thing, a lot of patience and a lot of skill. But even with patience and skill and time, you have to wonder how they made it. What kind of tools did they have to make these things? To me, that's one of the most fascinating chapters in all of this. The prisoners frequently had to make the tools in order to make the trinkets and the rings. Uh, one prisoner took a six-inch nail and drove it through a board in order to make a hammer. Another prisoner, Morris Evans of the private in the 4th Virginia Cavalry, told us exactly how he made his chessboard. Your humble servant, with the aid of a jackknife made from the slats in the bottom of a bunk, a set of chessmen and board, with which many hours quite pleasantly were spent. One officer held at Fort Delaware, Lieutenant William Witten of the 23rd Battalion Virginia Infantry, placed an advertisement in the prison's own homemade Prison Times newspaper that he and his neighbors had completed their machinery and were prepared to execute all kinds of sawing, turning, and drilling with neatness and dispatch. And apparently he used those tools to make a large cache of trinkets and even a box to keep them in. It wasn't just rings and trinkets. There was a lot of two-dimensional art created in prisons as well. Remember, soldiers were plying their arts and their trades in order to be able to barter for something, for food or other services. So a lot of the prisoner of war art it comes in the form of sketches, drawings, portraits, uh, calligraphy, uh, and even poetry written in prison autograph books. Uh, particularly at Johnson's Island, but also at Fort Delaware, and we have examples from Fort Warren, Boston. Prisoners were able to purchase autograph books or simply reuse little pocket notebooks as autograph books that they passed around among their, their friends and among the celebrities in the camp. And some prisoners chose to have those, or paid, to have those uh, uh, decorated by the men who were good at calligraphy and at sketches. So our collection of prisoner of war autograph books holds some of the finest examples of prisoner of war art. We have one collection that came in in the last 10 or 12 years of a, a soldier, Captain George Richwood of uh, the 1st Florida Infantry, which is, gives us a little insight into the prisoner of war art economy. Uh, we have for Richwood examples of his prisoner of war art, but also of uh, little advertisements that he created. Name is painted in Bibles and paintings by Richwood available at Division 28 at Fort Delaware where he was imprisoned. I tend to emphasize the commercial aspects of all of this because I think that's what people would find most surprising. But we shouldn't be surprised that a lot of the, the prisoner of war art has a very personal nature. The autograph books testify to this. They were collecting autographs and sentiments 
from men with whom they had passed through a, the crucible of war and a life and death situation. And a lot of the prisoner of war art was obviously very personal in nature, created not for a market, but for specific individuals, famous people. We have uh, a couple of pieces with the name Verena on it, intended for Verena Davis. Uh, others uh, made for family members. Uh, and the most touching one I think we have was made by a soldier named Thomas Horton of the 11th Virginia Infantry who uh, was, survived Gettysburg, Pickett's Charge, and was captured in an action in May, in May of 1864 and created a small wooden ring for his newborn daughter, Maggie. Unlike a lot of the 56,000 or so other prisoners, North and South, who died in prison camps during the war, happily Thomas Horton was able to make it home and present the ring to Maggie himself.